Well, that boy's appreciating again. Yeah, it's the appreciator. Yeah, this is, uh, what, number five in, uh, who knows, an ongoing series of uh, an attempt to not be so negative and have a place where it's not going to be somebody tearing stuff apart and pointing out the flaws. And I mean, that just seems to be so much of what we're exposed to. And uh, it's time for something upbeat. So we're, we're doing this. We're doing it uh, almost daily so far. And uh, including... Uh, uh, the, the the show images, I have to express my appreciation for my recent uh, European visitors. The liminaries came through and took a bunch of uh, photographs. So uh, you get to see uh, recent and decent images. Uh, that just, and yeah, I appreciate that. And um, let's see, we, we were, what were we going to talk about this time I well one thing that I definitely haven't touched on that I've been appreciating for years is the guy who made all of my podcasting feasible in any real way and that is Mr. Frank Edward Nora aka the Rampler from the Overnight Skate program who uh way back what in 2010 allowed me to join his overnight scape underground channel at and it's still there and all the shows i've ever done which you could try to listen to them all but i don't recommend that because it's just so much of it um but you can find these programs at onsug.com or if you search overnight scape underground over at archive.org uh there's that the interesting way to kind of check out the channel is every month frank posts every show that went over the station that month and you can play them in sequence and it's sort of like having your own night radio station and there are so many hosts and of course Frank is consistently there uh, at least a couple times a week um, when I'm on it we do a show that's kind of a gathering that anybody including you can participate in called the Overnight Scape Central and as I've mentioned we've been focusing on the Beatles for uh, most of 2023 and these shows I've been recently we've been going through each album album by album and everybody gets to have their say and their comment and it's it's just great stuff uh, pop culture conspiracy theories food movies uh, you it's just it's great stuff and I heartily recommend that to those who are fans of that kind of late night voice on the radio thing there's no ads it's just nothing for profit just people who like doing it and uh, that that really is the best of all entertainments is when that the, you can tell the person who is presenting or talking or the people who make it had a good time and were doing it because they wanted to, not because they were obliged to or somebody told them to. They call me crazy, but uh, that just and Frank just started uh, his night station revival, and he's been playing with this concept for years now, and uh, he's trying another version of it and i'm looking forward to where that goes uh it, it, it's it's kind of a absurdist internet radio sort of thing as opposed to you know this political or they're wrong i'm right and this is why and rah, rah, rah. Uh, it, it gets you know I, i'd rather just like think about grogu it, it's uh, yeah the baby yoda character from the mandalorian is just I, I find that little guy just so irresistible. I mean, uh, they could put him in almost anything, and I would be deeply compelled to watch. And I, I can't even say why, because I don't think I'm the type to, like, just be drawn to the cutesy-wootsy stuff. But 
Oh, he's just so cute and, and lovable. Oh, man, did, did, can you believe I said lovable? But it is so he is. And uh, speaking of other participants, um, Bob Lament and Miles Title have been doing, uh, they started at the dawn of podcasting, and they do this weekly program called Static Radio, which is not on the Overnightscape Underground. However, it's on YouTube every week. Um, just look up Static Radio, and it's basically this ongoing conversation these two guys just talking about life and what happens and and it 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 really is this gets the uh appreciator recommendation uh for those of you who uh, appreciate that kind of thing Uh, fun and bob is just a great guy uh i've done a few programs with him he did a series called prior casters which is somewhere on the internet and uh i guess i was included because i'm just barely make it as a pioneer of podcasting which i don't know i think i started a little late but uh if bob says i did i'm not going to argue about that um so that those those things are things that you should check out um and uh, I, let's take a minute, and uh, I started talking a little about comic books and comics, uh, which is something I have really appreciated since I was a wee laddie uh, reading the hand-me-down uh, golden, Silver Age Superman, Silver Age being those 1960s ones where Superman... I, I mean, I still have a taste for it, and, and many have a disdain for this era because it's silly. I mean, Superman used to be affected by, I mean, we all know that kryptonite, the green stuff, makes him weak and can kill him, and it's his uh, one true weakness. And, you know, Batman always carries a little piece around with him in case he has to, you know, Superman goes renegade and has to be taken down. But there were more types of kryptonite back in that day, and notably red kryptonite and as a silver age um trope these are just great funny goofy superhero comics red kryptonite would make superman do crazy things like lose his memory and become a hobo I mean, really, he would just like build a campfire and sit, try to sit with the other hobos, uh, roasting potatoes over an open fire, or he would lose some of his powers, or they would work in different ways. Um, uh, and the Supermans back then, there were other that Mister Mix Yez Pitalik, uh was. Uh, one of his main nemesis is and uh he would just make crazy mischief that superman would have to repair as he went along and and of course uh you can't beat up mr mixyes pitalik because he comes from the fifth dimension to cause mischief and he's kind of invulnerable to superman's physical strength and the only way that uh, superman can get rid of him is to get him to say his name backwards which i don't know how to do that but it's mix yes Pitalik backwards if there are bigger comic fans who can uh, do the approximation but i shan't do that here and uh, and and they were just the word comic implies kind of uh, a goofiness and a funness that somewhere in the 70s and 80s turned into this cutting-edge grimness, which is fun and good in its own way. I mean, I'm not dismissing the modern, you know, Alan Moore, Watchmen. Uh, it's just in general, modern comic books are much more serious and less apt to be goofy outright i mean i grew up reading stuff like i mean one of my favorites growing up were the sad sack comics which were harvey 
was a company that did, you know, Casper the Friendly Ghost comics and Wendy the Witch and Sad Sack, who was an army guy, uh, just a buck private who was always getting in trouble and having to do KP. I mean, many of the stories ended with him having messed up again at the Sarge. And he was cutting potatoes, this huge pile of potatoes, once more as uh, his his penance. And all sorts of characters, his best friend, the uh, unclean Slob Slobinski. Uh, there was Hi-Fi Tweeter, who was into jazz and kind of a beatnik soldier character. And of course, there was the general with his big belly and all his medals. And just... Who does stuff like that anymore? And it, maybe maybe we need this kind of thing. And, and another comic book series that I really, really liked. Um, some of you may remember, I, it might still appear in some newspapers somewhere, as I really don't see newspapers out here in the woods of Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, very often. Um, Dennis the Menace which, I don't know, some of you may remember the J North TV show or the 1980s film with, I think, Walter Matthau as uh, his nemesis, the neighbor, Mr. Wilson. Dennis the Menace was, you know, your five-year-old mischievous uh, little boy who was always uh, creating havoc. And uh, the comic book version had these epic stories. I mean, he would travel all over with his family to different places, Hollywood and Mexico and Europe. And these were like long, 64-page long stories and just fun stuff that that was the thing there were comic books that were just fun stuff uh, that, uh again those harvey comics um there were baby huey uh, who i don't i don't think they show the cartoons anymore but that these all these things were like cartoons also a lot of them i mean there were casper the friendly ghost cartoons um I don't know. There weren't Popeye comics that I got my hands on until later. I mean, if you can find the Bud Sagendorf Popeyes, which are reprinted here and there. Uh, in fact, recently, as recently as the early 2000s, there was a company reprinting those. And that just, just, we need more comical comics to balance the uh, evil blood filled, violent, ultra-violent sort of things that uh, the comic book evolved into and it's kind of rested there. Uh, I, I don't read very many current comic books. It's just, they're real expensive and I just, I don't know what's going on anymore. I mean, that it's, it's characters that were one thing I, well, times change. I mean, I can't criticize that. And as long as there are people who still like it, I mean, I'm not the target market for comic books. Um, to me, comic books, your target market is kids, what, five or six years old who are just learning to read until you're maybe 13 or 14. And then hopefully you graduate to real books and the stories and i mean i while i stuck in comics i started reading science fiction and uh, at least some literature i it wasn't until my uh probably late 20s early 30s that i started doing the literary thing uh, that and once I started doing the literary thing, uh, I found a lot of incredible authors. I mean, it's people like Vladimir Nabokov, who everybody knows that he wrote Lolita. And there's been the films, the one with Peter Sellers, and then the one they made in the, what, early 2000s. But that even he considered that one of his lesser if not the least of his novels and i kind of agree with that having read most of his novels um if you want to really get a taste of 
uh, Nabokov and what he was all about. There's a short novel that he wrote late in his life called Transparent Things, which is basically about uh, a character named Hugh Person. I, he, he was full of these just subtle puns and word plays that you wouldn't notice if you're not actually actively cherry picking for them but I've read transparent things several times and I'm sure I still haven't picked it all up but it's just about him reminiscing about a trip he took and the people he met and uh, no spoilers here but uh, and if you want something really rich and thick by Nabokov he wrote this epic novel called Ada, which is a love story on an alternate history earth. It almost qualifies as science fiction in a lot of ways. Um, their electricity works different in this world. And instead of uh, focusing on that, he just it presents that as part of this story uh, about this man and his life and his illicit uh, affection for his cousin. And it sort of goes into that Lolita zone, but it does, even Lolita, for those of you who haven't read it, there is nothing, even vaguely, pornographic. There's no like dirty passages that... uh, would be in a lot of novels uh, once the 70s happened you know that spicy stuff that somebody would write a novel and the publisher would say well how about a little spicy thing to get you know the kids I just and yeah as a kid uh, there were some science fiction magazines that had short stories that had just little short squibs a few paragraphs and uh, yeah that that was uh, before the days where just everything was porn and we had the internet just a little spice was all a feller needed and and, and was appreciated at the time um but yeah that's uh, uh nabokov is probably still one of my favorite authors and uh, just brilliant wordplay and wordsmith ship uh and his vocabulary i mean him and joseph conrad well joseph conrad is fascinating because people think nabokov's native language was russian and he learned english and then wrote these great books in english but english was spoken in nabokov's home as a child whereas joseph conrad literally learned English later in his life and his prose he wrote some of the Heart of Darkness which is probably his best known novel Apocalypse Now is quasi based on it his use of the English language and words is just oh it's like the cheesecake the richest deliciousest use of the language and it's definitely stuff uh, that if you have a taste for that, you'd appreciate. And uh, yeah, that's also, I mean, I, I, this show is about me expressing my appreciations and uh, maybe uh, uh, stuff you would as well. Oh, and I've, I've completely neglected um, th- th- that 1960s era mad magazine. I mean, this was so ubiquitous and yes these are comics even though they weren't i mean a comic was 12 cents and a mad magazine was what 30 35 cents and in black and white you know the cover cover was color but it was just this black and white but somehow it was just the coolest and funniest and it had all those little tiny sergio argonies cartoons in the margins and all the little hidden jokes and in the background of all the artwork and and just so many great 
artists and writers. You had your Don Martin and his goofy, elongated people doing crazy stuff. You had movie and TV satires with artwork by such great caricaturists as Mort Drucker and I guess later Angelo Torres, but Mort Drucker seemed to have done at least in my head, most of those, and Al Jaffe's famous fold-ins, which made the back covers always creased, which nowadays kills comic collectors. I mean, a mint condition mad magazine that has a fold-in is so scarce. I mean, who could resist folding it? at least once and then you know it's not mint condition anymore no matter what you do all the people who need things that seem to be unused Uh, i mean i appreciate that the signs of use A, a comic book was made you read it and you folded it and you stuck it in your back pocket and you pulled it out and gave it to your friend and somewhere maybe the cover came off But it was still a comic book. I mean, yes, the cover was nice to have. But as long as all the pages were still in there, you had a comic book. Now it's like, oh, don't touch it the wrong way and keep it in this bag with this board and and send it away to be graded and sealed in a plastic case that you can't even read the comic book ever again because it's valuable. Oh, man, it's just... (laughs) <laughs> while I'm not going to critique those who do that uh, the appreciator has very little if any appreciation for anything that's meant to be used that's kept in a sealed package I mean toys I mean, you're just supposed to play with them yeah be careful if you want but uh, things that seem to have never been used and they're 20 30 years old or more that 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 gives me agita of some sort um and mad magazine what what other stuff there was uh, dave berg who every month picked a topic and he called it the lighter side of and it was like the lighter side of um hospitals and there would be all these little strips where he would just make jokes little comic strips about hospitals and they'd have song parodies Uh, in fact they were the ones who kind of made those happen because when they first started it the people who wrote the original songs even though they didn't use the music or print the music the fact that they put these uh, alternate lyrics and said to the tune of caused a lot of stir but they went to court and they won. I mean, Mad Magazine was published, not really edited, but it was overseen by a man named William Gaines. And his vision for this magazine was awesome. Uh, a man named Al Feldstein was the editor. And uh, Gaines and Feldstein also did those crazy horror comics that got the comics code put into effect in the 1950s. Gruesome to talk about. But there was even a comic edge to those. I mean, those horror comics that were banned and uh, people said they caused juvenile delinquency and all kinds. There was such a goofiness to them when you go read them. They're not like grim like horror comics can be today Uh, although really horror in general I mean all these zombie movies there is a comical edge to them even when they're throwing buckets of blood at you you can look at it as this over the top humor and I think that always was more what I appreciated about horror after I was a little kid and even the universal horror movies which now seem ludicrous uh, that they were scary but you know like things like house of frankenstein also has all these uh, bride of frankenstein has the comedy relief old woman running around terrified uh, i don't know uh, but that's the stuff that that really is to me uh and mad had all of these imitations uh the black and white magazines like cracked uh or um there was another one sick 
and even um, Archie comics, which were in and of themselves a fun and humorous and goofy and light sort of thing that I'm not sure what they do now. They're that they modernized and modernized, and I don't think I've actually read one in many years, but it's just a different thing. I mean, it was just the malt shop and Jughead who just loved hamburgers and food and just was enough of a misanthrope that girls were not his thing, and Archie and not being able to decide uh, whether he liked the rich Veronica Lodge or the poor blonde Betty Cooper and the, the rivalry with Reggie Mantle who was kind of, Archie was the regular guy and Reggie was kind of rich like Veronica I mean, there's just simple tropes and everybody hung out at Pop's malt shop which reminds me of the Bowery Boys and uh, Louis's sweet shop I always wanted a cool place like that to hang out as a kid and there really wasn't although I guess that's the genesis of my love of the coffee shops of the 90s in Santa Fe, hanging out at the Aztec. But uh, as I was saying, even Archie did a sort of mad substitute they called uh, Madhouse, which they they got away with uh, somehow, even though it had the word mad in it. And, And those were kind of funny and goofy nowhere up to the level of the mad magazine i mean the mad magazine just was top-notch art and writing and satire on a level that older people could read it and kids could appreciate it it was uh, kind of universal and I guess when you got older, sometime in the 70s, I was just the right age to make the transition to the National Lampoon, which that was more edgy and political and uh, adult. Uh, There was like real, you know, boobies in the photo funnies. And, uh, you know, I had to to just sneak, to feel a little weird sneaking up because here I is a little kid buying a magazine with boobies in it uh, but uh, that they were kind enough to let me do that and uh, that Joe Rodas was the store in my hometown of Monticello New York there were a few stores that sold comic books and magazines but really the store of stores was Joe Rodas and and Joe was just such a character and, and and really kind I mean they caught me shoplifting comic books as a stupid kid uh, that's like that what gets you know I guess we all make mistakes but yeah there were more comic books than I could possibly afford on my allowance and I, I didn't my career as a comic book shoplifter did not last very long I don't think I was a very good thief and they caught me and um, they did let me back in the store again um, they just you know, for a while kept an eye on me and then realized maybe I learned my lesson and uh, until I left town that was my magazine store and I collected comic books on and off depending on my income. I mean, once I actually had to pay rent and pay for my own food, uh, the, the idea, and comic books went up in price. I mean, when they were 12 cents, that was one thing. But when they went up to a dollar or more, uh, it's just somewhere in my head that, that became an unneeded expense perhaps. But and now, oh boy, uh, while I don't understand, I mean, it's good that artists and writers are getting more money. And uh, back then it was this low art. And if you were a comic book artist, you just had to churn the stuff out and uh, you didn't get paid very well. But uh, people like Jack Kirby somehow yet thrived in that era uh, because they loved doing it and they were willing to spend 12 hour days drawing comic books which today nobody's nobody's doing that and they're getting even on any scale paid far higher amounts for their work which i'm not 
enough. To, I, although I kind of have studied, I have no idea whether that their art is worth more or less, or it's it's, it's, it's comic books were a low art. And if you didn't want to do comic books and you were good enough, you could go into other fields. I mean, illustration and advertising was, I guess, the goal back then. And a lot of uh, comic book artists, especially of the golden age, the good ones, that's what they wound up doing, working for ad agencies and making much better money doing fine art advertising work. And... um Oh, look at the time. We should probably part company at this point, and uh, th there'll be more appreciation soon enough. And if you've got comments or uh, ideas for topics I should tackle, uh, by all means, be in touch. Uh, the email address to catch me at is kpqr.torc at gmail. Dot com, And uh, it'd be great to hear from you one way or another. And uh, until the next time we meet, set the controls for the heart of the fun. It's a good idea.